Good afternoon to everyone as you're joining us. We're glad that you're all here. And we'll be starting at about noon for our webinar called Sample the Season. So welcome. And I'm here with our host, Jenna Smith. And I'll ask Jenna, Jenna, are you excited for farmers markets to start? Absolutely, Susan. I can't wait for farmers markets to start. I haven't gone yet, but um, ours here in Bloomington just opened, I think a week or two ago. I am so excited as well. And I love to go on Saturday mornings and get all of the nice, delicious baked goods and the fresh vegetables. It really helps my planning for groceries for the week so yeah it's kind of inspirational isn't it like when you it go is. and see just all the beautiful <laughs> produce and lots of different foods and yeah it's great yeah and as the summer goes on all of the produce so delicious all the tomatoes and the different herbs you can buy at the farmer's market you can really explore and try out new things so does anyone have a favorite that they like to buy at the farmer's market? You could add it to the chat box if you like, or maybe something that you've tried that you could suggest for us to try. Yeah, all the different microgreens. Isn't that fun, Kristen? You can try so many different things and the different tastes. Some are really peppery and some are a little bit of sweetness. So you can really change your flavors and your salads and cook with them and oh, green tomatoes and yeah, and add cilantro. That's one of my favorites, of course. Cilantro, you either love it or not, right? <laughs> one or the other, there's no in between. I know I love basil as well. That's something that I use a lot of in the summertime. Yeah, same here. Basil is probably my favorite herb. Yeah. Well, also welcome. goes really well with those tomatoes too. It sure does. I'm just looking at the picture you're showing us. So oh. <laughs> all the colors and the tomatoes and it all looks good, especially at lunchtime, right? Maybe you're all joining us and having lunch today while you're listening. But as you're coming in, welcome. We're so glad everyone's joining us. Just added all the different varieties of peppers you can buy at the farmers markets with all the different colors. Those are also so delicious to try and last nicely for the week. So 
you know, this year we, we planted rainbow carrots. That was what my seven-year-old son picked out to plant in our garden. <laughs> and I'm kind of excited about it. I love yeah. the, I can't wait to see all the different colors of these carrots. <sighs> That's going to be a lot of fun for the kids. Get them excited about gardening. Yeah, they're excited. We planted, we planted our carrots from seed. They're just now starting to kind of grow oh. <laughs> and they're like super excited to, to see that process. So it's fun. It is. I did some planting in my yard too. Everything's, and I, I'm glad we've had the nice rain we've had because it's all growing nicely out there. So it is. The roots have taken hold. Oh, and Kristen says she was just eating some with hummus. <laughs> I'll have to remember that. That's a good pairing. Yeah. Hummus is good with a lot of different vegetables. It is. We have a couple minutes left and we were just talking about what your favorite things are at the farmer's market and you're welcome to add it to the chat if you have some things that you could suggest for us to try we'd love to see it. I see lots of people are joining us so. I just finished my lunch and I had a, a, a cu cucumbers and apples together, which I really like, which may sound kind of strange, but it's actually a really good combination. So, well, you know, <laughs> last night, my, again, my seven year old, he put bananas on top of his lettuce salad and he said it was really good. <laughs> We'll have to try that. We'll have to I, see. You know, huh? I said, hey, fruits, fruits can go into lettuce salads. I have not, though, heard of bananas on lettuce salads. So I think I'm just going to leave that up to him and let him take his word for it that it's actually good. Yeah. Don't feel bad. My daughter used to put chocolate pudding with her lettuce. <laughs> she ate it. So as long as she ate the lettuce, I was happy. So what can we say? kind of funny the combinations kids come up with <clears throat> all right we're just about ready to start and so again welcome to everybody joining us for sample the season <clears throat> okay, well, it's noon and we'll get started. So I'd like to welcome everyone and say good afternoon. Uh, we are happy that you're here with us and welcome to the Sample of the Season webinar by University of Illinois Extension. Before we start, just double check that your microphone is muted and that your camera's off. And this just helps with any background noise and it gives us a strong bad bandwidth for today. And if you have questions, you're welcome to add them to the chat box as Jenna's speaking today. And then at the end of her presentation, we'll give some time for Q&A. Also, I will share a link today that will go to a survey. And then after you complete that survey, you'll receive your handout automatically. So watch for that at the end of our presentation. And today's webinar is being recorded it will be stored on the State Nutrition and Wellness website, and you can find that at goillinois.edu nutrition and wellness. And the University of Illinois Extension is the flagship outreach effort of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign 
We offer research-based educational programs to the residents of Illinois in all 102 counties and far beyond. And I'm your moderator, Susan Glassman. I'm a University of Illinois Extension Nutrition and Wellness Educator and serve Bureau LaSalle Marshall in Putnam counties. Your presenter today is Jenna Smith. She also is a nutrition and wellness educator and serves Livingston, McLean and Woodford counties. And Jenna is a registered dietitian with her master's degree in public health. So I will welcome everyone once again. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Jenna for her presentation. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, you know, as we are kind of talking in the chat, you know, one of my favorite summer activities is certainly going to the outdoor farmers market. And, you know, this of course is where we find just all sorts of different types of food and particularly those fruits and vegetables, which look so, you know, so delicious and so yummy. Um, now I am a fan of charts and graphs. So that's actually where we are going to uh, start here today. So this chart um, here tells us that according to the USDA, most adults are not meeting the recommendations of the USDA dietary guidelines. Uh, so you can see in this chart, which compares the diets from 1970, which is in orange, uh, to the diets in 2017, which is in green. And Americans are eating more than the recommended amount of meats eggs, nuts, and grains. However, we are desperately falling short in the consumption of vegetables, dairy, and fruit. Now, the benefit of fruits and vegetables are many, but yet only one out of every 10 American adults actually get the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables each day. So most adults, they need about one and a half to two and a half cups of fruit and between two to four cups of vegetables every day. And so we know that a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, it can lower the risk of heart disease, stroke, some types of cancer, and it can lower the risk of eye and digestive problems as well. Uh, plus, you know, if you're replacing some of those higher calorie foods with fruits and vegetables, which tend to be a lot lower in calories, then it can lead to a lower calorie intake. And this can really decrease the risk of weight gain. And we know that fruits and vegetables are a source of many vitamins, minerals, and dietary fiber that our bodies really need to kind of perform our daily functions. So no single fruit or vegetable really provides us with all the nutrients that we need in order to be healthy. Um, so variety is really just as important as quantity. So whenever you're planning your meals, it's really important to think about the color. You know, if you've ever been told to eat the rainbow, well, this is what we're talking about here. So your fruits and vegetables, they naturally contain compounds that's called phytochemicals. And they're behind those colors that make these fruits and vegetables really so vibrant. So I'm not gonna go into naming all of the phytochemicals, but just understand that different phytochemicals have different health benefits. And so, you know, some of them may have cancer fighting properties and support healthy blood pressure and reduce macular degeneration or, you know, support our immune function. So it's really important to, to think about, you know, getting a lot of different color um, in those meals and in those fruits and vegetables in particular. Okay, so yes, back to my charts here. Um, there was one USDA study that actually analyzed spending on fruits and vegetables. And so it surveyed about 4,826 households. And among these households, 170 bought some of their fruits and vegetables directly from farmers at roadside stands, farmers markets, or other direct to consumer outlets. Um, and another 3,388 households bought fruits and vegetables exclusively just at like a non-direct food store. But the researchers found that purchasing fruits and vegetables at a direct to consumer outlet was positively associated with several healthy practices. So for example, people that bought fruits and vegetables directly from farmers were more likely to have a vegetable garden. Um, they were more likely to be aware of USDA's My Plate campaign and to search the internet for information on healthy eating. And households that bought fruits and vegetables directly from farmers were also more likely to rate the healthfulness of their diets as either being excellent or very good. 
So, you know, while this is maybe just one small study on consumer perceptions, I do think that it really does, you know, encourage us to patronize local farmers more frequently, particularly because, yes, it can lead to, you know, possibly higher levels of fruit and vegetable spending and hopefully uh, more fruit and vegetable intake. So what's in season can really be dependent upon where you live and in what part of the state that you live in. You know, the southern part of Illinois, for instance, may have a slightly different growing season than northern Illinois. But roughly, these are the types of produce that you may find during each of the four seasons. And some produce will certainly overlap between seasons. You know, you may find uh, winter squash and cabbage and spinach, for example, in the fall and in the winter seasons as well. And some produce such as radishes, herbs, mushrooms, maybe a lot of the dark greens, um, potatoes and onions, some of these can may even be found you know, all year round. Um, if you get the handout, there will be a link in the resources that'll take you to a web page that lists the season that you can expect to find most Illinois produce. So it'll encompass even more than what you see here on the screen. But you know, having an idea of what's in season before you go to the farmer's market can really help you plan your menu. So we'll talk more about um, meal planning here um, in a little bit. Okay, so we're gonna play a little game called Guess the Produce. Um, so these are, are maybe some of the more unfamiliar types of produce that I'm gonna show you um, that you still might though find at a market that you might think, ah, I don't know what to do with this. So you might just pass it up. Um, so I'm going to put this in uh, these pictures on here and I want you to go ahead in the chat box, you know, try to take a guess and, and let me know what do you think this is. So um, here's the first one. Any guesses out there? I think okay. they got it, Jenna. Are you watching the chat box? Yeah, okay. that's great. That's great. Very good. So yeah, we've got some smart people out there. We've got bok choy. So bok choy is also referred to as Chinese white cabbage. Um, it is a staple ingredient in a lot of Asian dishes. And it, the taste of bok choy is, is kind of mild. I think it kind of has like a slightly mustard flavor. Um, but immature bok choy is called baby bok choy. And it's even more tender and, and even a little bit milder in flavor. Uh, and of course, it's going to be smaller as well but uh, you're going to store bok choy uh, in a plastic bag in the refrigerator for about three to four days. And when you're preparing bok choy, you're just gonna wash it like you would wash a lot of like leafy greens in a, in a bowl of water. And I'll, I'm gonna actually show you a, vid a video here in a bit on how to do that. But you'll, you'll trim the root portion. So there at the, at the bottom, you'll see the little root. You're just gonna trim that off. Um, and uh, you've got your stems, of course, uh, there, and you're going to separate those from the leaves. Um, and you can separate those um, you, when you're working with kind of regular bok choy, uh, because the stems will need to be cooked uh, for just a little bit longer than those leaves. Those leaves won't take very long to, to cook at all. So it might be best if you can um, just kind of separate those. Uh, and then you can you know, steam bok choy, you can roast it, saute it. Um, lots of different uh, ways to prepare that bok choy. And a nice advantage of baby bok choy is the fact that you really can cook the whole thing. Um, sometimes people just maybe slice it in half uh, and you can create, you know, cook the whole thing, either roasted in the oven or even just a sauteed in a saute pan. Um, and it creates kind of a nice visual dish. Um, but add flavor enhancers to bok choy whenever you're cooking. So think Asian flavors. You know, it goes really well with fresh ginger and garlic. Uh, soy sauce, maybe a, a little bit of honey or, or sesame oil goes really good with, with bok choys. And you can, you know, uh, use bok choy in stir fries, uh, put it in soups, or just basically on its own as a side dish as well. You can do bok choy um, as raw as well too. Baby bok choy though is going to do better raw. Uh, and you can eat it like uh, in salads and things like that. Okay, we're going to move on to the next one. What do we think this one is? Any guesses? Okay. I see a lot of guesses here and I think most everybody is right, it's fennel. So this is actually fennel. Uh, fennel is technically an herb, but it's bulb base there is, is commonly used as a vegetable. 
So fennel has a taste um, of licorice, but if that makes you think of your hatred for black jelly beans, because um, I don't like black jelly beans, um, don't let this stop you because I'm telling you, you will really be surprised. Um, fennel is much more of a subdued licorice flavor. I really enjoy fennel, but I do not like black jelly beans. <laughs> Um, so you're going to store fennel in a plastic bag in the refrigerator for about seven to 10 days. And to prepare this, you're going to first wash it uh, under running water. You can shake it or pat, pat it dry. Um, and then you'll see fennel has a white bulb. And then it's got these green stalks with these kind of feathery leaves um, at the very top. And those are called fronds. Uh, and the entire fennel plant is actually edible. So uh, you'll first just slice the top of the bulb away from the stems, and then you can pinch off those feathery fronds and you can use them like as a garnish, or I like to chop them up and then use them as an herb and throw them in like in salads and things. But the stems can also be eaten kind of like celery, or they can also be chopped and used in soups. And the bulb really also lends itself to a variety of uses. So you'll first just remove any kind of brown kind of outer layer um, around the bulb, just take that off and then just cut the bulb in half like vertically. And you'll notice like this white core that's kind of in a triangular shape. So just cut at that at a diagonal and remove that triangle core um, because it's just, it's kind of too tough to eat. So you'll just wanna remove that. But then you're ready to just slice and chop up the bulb and it really goes really well in like um, salads. Um, you can use it in coleslaw or in pasta salads as well, but you can also cook fennel. So you can saute it or grill it, um, even roast it. And that kind of helps to soften up the bulb and it takes on kind of a, a whole new sweet flavor. Um, you can add it to soups, pasta dishes, or also alongside some meats as well. Okay, we've got this next one. What does everybody think this one is? Do you have any guesses? Ah, yes, okay. Yeah, delicata uh, squash, yeah, very good, okay. So the delicata squash, um, this is a type of winter squash. So look for it, especially in like September or October. Um, I've always known them um, to be referred to as like sweet potato squash. Um, and it's probably my favorite because they have a really very sweet taste and they're generally smaller than some of um, the other winter squash. And so they're really kind of nice and easy to work with. Plus they have a pretty thin skin, which makes it just so much easier to peel than a lot of those other winter squashes. Um, plus some of the recipes too, you can actually leave that skin on. So you're just gonna wash the outside with a clean vegetable brush, and then you can just cut off um, the stem and the bottom ends and slice it lengthwise. And then you're gonna see some seeds just like you would with other squashes. And so just spoon those out. You can save the, save the seeds for later and roast them if you want to. Um, but then you can just roast the two halves, like cut side down until the flesh is, is nice and soft. And then you can you know mash it um, and eat it kind of like mashed potatoes, or you can like turn it into a pureed soup or a bisque. Um, or you could also just, instead of slicing it um, or just cooking it like that, you can just slice the two halves in like moon shapes. Um, and that really makes it like a really beautiful side dish um, as well. And you can use the squash just like you would for sweet potatoes or you know any other kind, type of like butternut or acorn squash. So it can be used in casseroles or maybe some veggie tacos with black beans, or maybe even like um, cooked in a kale salad. Okay, so we've got three more. Here's the next one. What do we think about this one? Any ideas on what this is? No ideas. Oh, there we go. Okay. Daikon radish. Yes. So that's exactly what this is. Um, daikon radish, you know, just like just like there are many kinds of squash, there's also going to be a lot of different kinds of radishes. Um, there's also a black Spanish radish or watermelon radish. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of highlighting here the daikon radish, which really looks more like a white carrot, you know, than, than a radish. Um, it's a root vegetable. It does tend to be sweet and kind of milder than the peppery red radishes that I think a lot of us are used to. Um, but the daikon radish is pretty common in a lot of Asian cuisine. 
So you're going to store these radishes in a plastic bag in the refrigerator for about 10 to 14 days. And if the greens are still on them, um, you will want to just remove them before you store them. They'll keep better if you do that. So you can use the greens to make pesto, or you can even throw them in soups. So you can definitely eat those greens as well. You'll just store them unwashed in a plastic zip closed bag with a damp paper towel in the crisper drawer. And like carrots, daikon radishes, they don't need to be peeled, but they do need a good scrub with a clean vegetable scrush. Um, brush. So you may still peel them if you want to, but you don't have to. Uh, these radishes, they can be in raw or you can cook them, uh, though when they get too big, uh, I think they're probably better cooked than raw. Uh, when they are cooked, they are sweet and they're nice and tender. And you can use them in stir fry. Um, you can pickle them and, and use them maybe in kimchi. Um, raw, raw daikon radishes are also good in a lot of like salads and slaws too. Okay, we're moving on to the next one. What do you think this one is? Any guesses? Okay, we've got some guesses. Turnip, rutabaga. So those are some really good guesses. This is actually a rutabaga. And um, it's interesting because yeah, rutabaga, rutabagas, they are a root vegetable and it is a cross between the turnip and the cabbage. So the, the turnip is a good guess. Um, and while rutabagas, they are similar to a turnip, rutabagas are harvested at kind of a larger size and they have more of a yellowish uh, flesh and kind of that darker purple brown skin that you see. Some people will say that they're ugly, but you know, I think that all produce um, um, can be quite beautiful. So now, although the peel of the rutabaga does appear to be pretty tough, it's actually quite easy to peel. Um, so just take a sharp vegetable peeler and that will pretty much easily strip that skin for you. Now it's interesting that a lot of times if you purchase a rutabaga at the grocery store, they're going to put a wax over that. They're going to use like paraffin wax um, and that just helps them to kind of keep for a lot longer. So they'll keep, you know, plenty of months after you purchase them. Um, it can be removed by scrubbing it under warm water or with a vegetable peeler. But, you know, it's nice buying rutabaga locally, so you don't have to do that. And it's best to store rutabagas in a cool, dark place, such as a cold root cellar um, or a refrigerator. And they'll keep in the refrigerator for about two to three weeks. Um, you can eat rutabaga raw or you can eat it cooked. You're just going to slice the, the ends off and then peel them. And you can chop rutabagas into like a stew or you can puree it into a creamy soup. Um, I sometimes like to heat like cubed rutabaga in boiling water and then um, mash it with a bit of milk. I'll put like a little bit of sour cream and some seasonings in there to kind of mimic, you know, mashed potatoes. Um, for some people, they might think that rutabaga has a little bit of this kind of tangy flavor. So I would recommend that, you know, you combine it with other types of root vegetables. Um, so if you're going to do, you know, mashed rutabagas, maybe use half potatoes and then half rutabagas. Um, or you can roast rutabaga mixed with other root vegetables like beets or, you know, other types of potatoes, carrots and other things as well, too. Okay, last one here. What do we think about this one? This looks, it looks a little bit like a space alien, um, but I see we've got some guesses here and yes, that's kohlrabi. So kohlrabi. Um, so kohlrabi, is, it's, it's not a root vegetable, but it's, it's part of the cabbage family. And sometimes it goes by the name of cabbage turnip, but um, some will say that it tastes a little bit more like a radish. Um, while most people will only use this, this bulb, the entire plant, including the stems and the leaves, are actually edible. So you can store it in a plastic bag in the refrigerator for about four to five days. And to use kohlrabi, you're going to wash and, and cut off those stems and the root from the bulb. Um, just take a paring knife and you're going to peel that kind of tough outer layer. So you see this kind of green outer, outer layer there. It is pretty tough. So just cut that off and then what you're going to see is this kind of cream color inside and that's what you want to get to. Um, you can then cut it up and use it raw for snacking. I love to snack on kohlrabi. Um, it's also delicious in slaws and salads as well. 
And you can roast them in the oven um, and um, you know, kind of the outside of them will kind of caramelize for a little bit of a sweeter taste. Um, but you can slice thin and they could be made into chips. Uh, you can try them in stir fry, you know, throwing in the dark green leaves even as well. Okay. Well, you guys did great. That's awesome. So um, I'm going to show you just here a, a little bit of a video that I have a colleague here who's going to show us how to wash um, leafy greens. So there we go. going to wash some leafy greens. If you have a garden or you go to the farmer's market, lettuces and other leafy greens are going to have some soil on them. So we want to get all the dirt off and we do that by filling a basin or a tub full of cool water. You really don't want to do this in your sink because your sink could have some bacteria in it and you certainly don't want that on your lettuce. So we're going to dump our greens in the basin and swish them around quite a bit. You might want to trim some of the ends off as you go, pulling out any discolored leaves, leaves that have some insect damage on them. You want to get those out of there as well. Move them in that water to loosen any particles of dirt that are in between the leaves. Pull them out. You're going to do this until your water is clear. And you can see my water is very dark. So we're going to dump this, add more water, and do it again. You don't need any commercially prepared wash. You don't need to use any chemicals. Plain water will clean your fruits and vegetables to a safe level. When you pour the water out of your basin after your final rinse, you shouldn't feel any grit. We're gonna spin all the moisture off of our lettuce. You shouldn't wash your fruits or vegetables until you're ready to eat them. Moisture will cause them to spoil more quickly. And there we have fresh greens ready to eat. If you would like to wash your lettuce a few hours ahead and store it, put it loosely in a plastic bag, put a paper towel in so it can absorb some of the moisture, and then place this in the vegetable crisper drawer of your refrigerator. Okay. So yeah, I love the, the nice salad spinner. It's probably one of my favorite tools. Um, okay. So, you know, thinking about maybe some different ways to use produce aside from simply having it just as like a side dish. Um, certainly you can have it as a side dish, but there's many ways that we can use um, our produce. So you can try adding, you know, kohlrabi or daikon radish, for example, to the next vegetable tray. Um, spiralizing is kind of the new thing. So you can purchase a spiralizer or even just a julienne peeler will do the same thing. It'll make noodles out of zucchini, carrots, sweet potatoes, and you know, so much more. You can blend almost any type of leafy green like spinach into a nice fruit smoothie, um, or you can peel and seed cucumbers and melon for kind of a nice cool combination smoothie. Try different toppings for pizza. So my favorite is mashed sweet potato as kind of like the sauce. And then I'll add caramelized onions and then top it with kale. Um, really delicious. Add some mozzarella cheese, some red pepper flakes, and it's, it's definitely my favorite. Add spinach, Swiss chard, kale, onions, peppers, mushrooms, so many different things that you can add to your eggs in the morning. And pesto doesn't have to just be made with that traditional basil. You can use lots of different herbs. So mint or garlic scapes, um, which are the garlics like young shoots, arugula. Um, I think I saw Kristen said she uses radish greens. You know, lots of different types of greens can be used for pesto. Most of any vegetable can also be put in a stir fry. So if all else comes to fail, throw it in a stir fry. <laughs> Okay, and lastly here, it can be um, kind of difficult sometimes to plan the week's menu before you go to the farmer's market because you won't always know what will be available. Um, but you can certainly guess by knowing what's in season, but you know, sometimes growing conditions um, can maybe have affected the harvest or maybe you know, everything was sold out before you arrived. So you basically have two options. You can plan the menu first before you arrive at the farmer's market. So you know, write down your menu, your list, um, or use an app on your phone and you know bring that with you. 
You can plan the non-vegetable portion of your meals. So you plan out the meat or the main protein, and then maybe add the vegetable part after seeing you know, what looks best at the market. Uh, be prepared though to make substitutions. So if the market doesn't have what you are after, you know, for example, if you can't find kale, can you maybe substitute Swiss chard instead? Um, your other option then is to shop first and then plan your menu. So this allows you to use the farmer's market as kind of the inspiration. And it helps really to ensure that, you know, you're going to use what you buy, uh, maybe allowing you to use ingredients that you already have on hand and reducing that food waste. Uh, just be careful not to go too crazy and buy too much at once where it might go bad before you actually get the chance to use it. Uh, but no matter, you know, whether you shop first or you plan the menu first, you know, do look at the schedule um, for your week and just determine, you know, how much time do you have to spend towards preparing and chopping produce um, and cooking. And I think that is it. So I'm going to turn it back over to Susan and let you kind of finish it out. Okay, great. Thank you, John. And thank you for all that wonderful information. I'm sure everybody learned a lot. It was really great. Thank you. Um, we will do some Q&A in just a moment. We'll stay after for a couple of minutes if you have questions. If you need to, to head out, we understand. I am going to add our survey link in the chat box. And as you grab onto that link, it'll take you to the survey, complete your survey, and then you will see Jenna's handout which has all of the information she covered today, plus recipes. So don't miss out on that. I'd like to remind everybody that we'll return next month on June 16th, and we're going to be talking about what to expect at farmer's markets. And this is our Eat Fresh and Eat Local series. And the registration site is on the slide here, go.illinois.edu backslash eat fresh eat local. And we'd like to thank everyone for attending. We will um, put our recording on our nutrition and wellness page um, for Illinois Extension. And that site is, I'll put it in the chat box for everybody. It's called go.illinois.edu nutrition and wellness. So here that comes. And if anyone has any questions, we'll hang on for a few minutes. And if not, we are, so glad that everyone was here with us today. And thank you so much, Jenna, for all the great information. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. And thank you everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. Yeah, there just was a couple comments, which we can um, go through that. Fennel can be chopped up and added to spaghetti sauce in small pieces, mm -hmm. which I think would be really delicious. Absolutely. You can use radish greens to make pesto. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see if we have anything else here. Um, oh, repeat the website for the recording. Okay, I'm going to add it to the chat. I'll repeat it. And then Jenna, what's some favorite ways to spiralize? Oh, yeah. So um, some some favorite vegetables that I love to spiralize, um, of course, zucchini, I feel like that's that's a given so many people um, do spiralize zucchini. Um, we also love um, sweet potatoes and butternut squash. Um, so kind of, you know, either or um, that works really well, I think with um, pasta sauce. So my kids um, really enjoy, you know, eating spaghetti um, with those kind of spiralized noodles that kind of sweetens it up, um, especially so you don't have to have maybe such a sugary type of, uh, you know, uh, tomato spaghetti type sauce. Um, because the noodles kind of give it that sweet taste. So that those are just probably my favorites, but there are so many things that you can spiralize. Um, there's really just a, a lot of different options. Yeah, have fun and explore. And the zucchinis are a great one. And especially if you have a garden and, and at the farmer's market as well, because they're very much in plenty plentiful during this season. So. Right. Yeah, <laughs> they, they really are. You know, sometimes I'm like, how am I going to use, you yeah. know, use up all my zucchini? So spiralizing is a great option for that. And it is really delicious with using it as sp for spaghetti. So yeah, um, someone wanted our website for the recording and I'll mention it again. It's go.illinois.edu nutrition and wellness. And I put it into the chat box as well. Yep, and I see here that Kristen put the short URL in, so she's got it there. You okay, can, there um, we go. Copy and paste. Yep. Yep. 
So I think we've got it. We want to thank everyone. And I don't see any other questions coming through. So we really are glad everyone was with us and we'll finish up for today. So thank you so much. All right. Yeah, thank you. Just going to share that link one more time if someone needs it. Hang on. Okay, Jenna, thanks. We'll catch up later if you want. Okay, sounds good. All right, I'll talk Bye. to you later. Bye-bye.